was reading in Luke this past week, and in Luke chapter 19, it's the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. He's coming down the mountain and the disciples, they begin to praise him, they begin to praise him loudly. And the group of Pharisees, they were watching this happen and they looked at Jesus and they told him, rebuke them. And Jesus looked at them and said, I tell you this, if they don't cry out, the very stones will. If we don't cry out, the stones will. If we don't praise him, the rocks will praise him. And I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna let a rock praise him for me. I'm not gonna sit here silent while the, uh, the rest of creation praises him. I'm gonna lift my hands, I'm gonna lift my voice, I'm gonna sing as loud as I can, because he's worthy of that. Do you believe that? He's worthy. So we're gonna sing this next song. And I want us, us, us as a church to sing this loudly to him. Can we do that together?
glorify you this morning. A thousand hallelujahs is not enough. But Lord, we're gonna keep singing in the good times and the bad, in the joy and the pain. So Lord, right here, right now, we just ask Lord, that you would show just a small glimpse of yourself, that we walk out truly with the joy of the Lord as our strength. Walking out with other believers that are excited about their faith, excited about what may come. Looking past the doom and gloom of this world and looking to you and your glory. So God, be with us this morning. Teach us from your word. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I hope everybody's doing well. Everyone at home, thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to check in. Say hi to somebody in the chat. Everyone in the room, connection folders are coming forward. Say hi to somebody and have a seat. Thanks. Splash Fest and Camp Gata happening July 18th through 22nd. Visit our website to register or to volunteer. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day, right? We're celebrating all our dads today. Welcome our online crew joining us this morning. I hope you have uh, are taking some time to celebrate uh, your dad, and uh, I hope, uh, dads, you are being celebrated today. You know, there's also another significant reason in the history of our nation to celebrate today, and that is it is a celebration of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is a big deal in the history of our country when we finally recognize that freedom was for all. And so we also celebrate that today in a very real way. I do want to mention to you that we are planning a trip to Israel in March. So if you would, if you are interested, then make sure you stop by out in the lobby, put your name on the list, and uh, because you want to receive all the correspondence about it, even if you're just thinking about it at this stage, don't not sign up because then you'll miss out on communications. Sign up, take a brochure so that we can, uh, we can begin the communications on what the possibilities are to go to Israel next March. I want to encourage you strongly to do that. So we're involved in our teaching series, Elements. And Elements is about taking the foundational doctrines of the church making them personal so that we know them and we own them and they're a part of who we are because that helps us understand how God designed us to have relationship with him. Now this morning we're going to talk specifically about the Trinity, right? It's one God revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So two weeks ago, we talked about God the Father. Last week, we talked about God the Son. Today, we're talking about God the Holy Spirit, three in one. You know, the Trinity is seen all throughout the Scriptures. You can go into the Old Testament, you can read through the New Testament, and the Trinity appears over and over and over again. I'm only going to read one verse to you this morning about the Trinity. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, and it reads this way. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
I want to say this about the Trinity. The Trinity is a foundational Christian doctrine. It is absolutely essential to understand how we're to live in relationship with God. Now, you've probably run into uh, someplace, sometime, a group that would say, well, we're really Christian, but we do not believe in the Trinity. Those two statements do not go together. The Trinity is a foundational orthodox doctrine of the Christian church. So if you're talking to somebody from a group or something from a different, from a belief system, they say, well, we really don't believe in the Trinity. They are not orthodox, traditionally Christian in spite of their use of the word Christian. You see, the Trinity is an incredible mystery. That's often why people will say, well, I don't believe in the Trinity because I can't figure it out. It just doesn't make sense. It's a mystery. Absolutely, it's a mystery. But being a mystery, does it enhance our understanding of who God is or does it decrease our understanding of who God is? I mean, in reality, if you could figure everything out there is to know about God, then God would not be God. If you in your finite state, right, if you in your finite state can understand everything about the infinite, then you've either elevated yourself way too high or you've lowered God way too low. Now, we do have an attempt to try to understand the Trinity, right? It's important that we do have some understanding of it. And, and so historically, we used all sorts of physical analogies to try to understand the Trinity. And if you've grown up in Sunday school, you've probably heard all of these. There's more than these, but, but you probably heard the triangle used, right? And, uh, and there's three sides, but there's one triangle. Well, you know, every physical analogy falls short at some point or another. So there are, you know, there's one triangle, but there is not three opposing sides to God. Or you might get the egg, right, where they bring the egg out. They say, hey, here's the shell, here's the egg white, here's the the yolk. There's three different parts, but yet one. Well, there aren't three different parts to God. There is one God revealed as three. And then probably the most popular as we were growing up was the H2O idea. You familiar with the H2O idea? It's this idea that H2O presents itself to us as a liquid, right, water, as a solid, ice, or as a vapor, right, steam. And and, and then there's three different modes of God that, depending on the circumstances, that's who shows up. Well, of course, that analogy fails because there are not three different modes of God. There is God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. So the scripture teaches us that there are some things that will always remain a mystery to us. There, the scripture just says that, right? I mean, right, it's all through the scripture where it talks about there are some things that are always going to remain a mystery to you. Isaiah chapter 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than than your thoughts. So, I mean, the scripture tells us, hey, I mean, you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna understand everything. You're not gonna know everything. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, the words of Paul. The apostle Paul says, now I know in part. So there the apostle Paul saying, well, I don't know at all. I only know a part. How much of a part does he know? I don't know, 33%, 50%, 62%. 80%. I don't know what part he knows, but he's making a confession. He's saying, now I know in part, but then I shall fully know. So the scripture tells us that, man, this side of heaven, you will not know everything. And believe it or not, that helps us. That helps us with the very important belief. You're not God. And you and your finiteness will never understand everything there is to know about God. That doesn't weaken God. That strengthens God. That puts God in his proper position and it puts us in our proper position. So we learn to trust him, right? We learn to go by his word. We learn to say, hey man, God is three in one. And we accept that. We accept the mystery because we understand we're finite and he is not. 
But this morning, like for, for our teaching purpose, as much as we acknowledge and we understand it is three in one, they are not separate. They are revealed as Father, Son, and Spirit. But for our teaching purposes, we're going we're gonna to define them a little bit just to help us get our mind around it and, and learn. So, so this morning, let's just think about this for a second. God the Father revealed His Creator. God the Son revealed His Savior. And God the Holy Spirit revealed as the Transformer. God collectively revealed through creation, salvation, and transformation for our lives. Now, if you would do a, if you do a study on the, on, on the Holy Spirit in the scriptures, you'd find out there are, there are several names for the, for the Holy Spirit that help us know him. There, it talks about several roles the Holy Spirit plays in the scripture, and that would help us understand him. I would recommend strongly you do a study like that about the, about the Holy Spirit in your life. But this morning, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, four broad areas that the Spirit transforms us. First of all, the Spirit transforms us because He's our helper. The Scripture says that the Spirit comforts us, that the Spirit reminds us when we forget, that the Spirit gifts us when we feel like we can't do what God asks us to do. I mean, He helps us understand that we are not alone. You're not alone. Man, God the Holy Spirit is with you. God the Holy Spirit is in you. God the Holy Spirit is helping you. The Holy Spirit is called in the scripture that he's our guide. It says he teaches us. We learn from him. It says that he is the one that reveals wisdom to us. So, so if somebody ever says, well, you know, you're a pretty wise person. You know, you don't take that in into yourself, right? That comes from the spirit at work in your life, developing wisdom in you. It says that the spirit leads us into all Truth. So, I mean, the great word from God is you don't have to figure it out on your own. In fact, you can't figure it out on your own. Man, you need the Holy Spirit to help you. You need the Holy Spirit to go beyond what your human intellect can think. You need the Holy Spirit to deepen your understanding and broaden your mind and broaden your heart on who it is that God is and relationship with him. Uh, the Holy Spirit in the Scripture is called our cleanser. He convicts us. He convicts us. Now, some of us may look and say, wait a minute, conviction's not a good word. Oh, no. Y you know how it says in the Scripture that Satan is the accuser? You know what an accusation is about? An accusation is about calling you out, and it's about your punishment. It's about how you're no good. You know what conviction is about? Conviction is about your forgiveness and your redemption. That's what conviction's about. Conviction's about bringing you onto a path of healing. And then, and then it says he's our cleanser because he sanctifies us. He's our cleanser because he burns up the chaff that exists in our life. Right? One of the things the Holy Spirit does is anything that's in us that opposes God, man, it's the Holy Spirit targets that and goes after that in us. And then the fourth and the final thought about the role of the Holy Spirit in transformation is that the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the words of Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You know what the Greek word is there for power? It's the Greek word dynamos. Sound familiar? That's where we get our word dynamite from. So the scripture, Jesus is telling his disciples that when you receive the Holy Spirit in your life, there is an explosive power that God has given you. The power to move mountains. The power to... To, to, to shake very foundation of things. Man, when he calls you, he empowers you. Now, now I recognize that when we, talk about, when we talk about the Holy Spirit or we talk about spiritual things or we talk about the Holy Spirit living in us, I recognize that there's, there's, there may be a little bit of hesitancy in people about that. You may say, hey, I absolutely believe in Jesus. Yep, I prayed to accept Jesus as my Savior. But this whole idea about 
you know, God living in me and the Holy Spirit. That's a, I'm just a little bit hesitant about that. And you know, I think mostly where that hesitation comes from is we don't understand who we are and how God has made us. Like we don't understand it, how, how the creator designed us. And then because we don't understand it, we, uh, we trust the wrong things. We live life incorrectly to how he would choose for us to live. So, so I want to talk a little bit this morning about how God has made you. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. The apostle Paul says this about you. Do you not know? Obviously, he thinks they didn't know. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So one of the things the scripture tells us is that God designed you to be a temple. He designed you to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you think about the definition of a temple, right, there's two definitions of a temple, right? That, you know, what's a temple used for? Well, the, the first one is that, a, that the temple is a place devoted to the worship of God, right? I mean, man, a temple is some place that says, hey, this place has been set aside. It, it's established for a reason. It was built for a purpose. And the purpose of this temple is that it's gonna be devoted to God. That's why the temple was created, that you were created to be devoted to God. I mean, man, there's, 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 there's other places you might put your devotion, but you never find satisfaction. You never find fulfillment. You, you might get some, 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 some temporary uh, like, 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 like enjoyment, obviously from other things, but, but ultimately our fulfillment is found in being devoted to God. And the second definition of this temple is that a temple is a place that is regarded as the dwelling place of God, the house of God. I mean, this is, where, this is where God lives. This is where God dwells. He dwells in his temple, right? It's the dwelling place of God. And we see that throughout the New Testament or in, in the Old Testament. Like even when, they, even when they established the tabernacle, how the Shekinah glory of God came to rest in the place. When Solomon dedicated the temple, the, 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 the Shekinah glory of God came down upon the place. And so Paul says, no, you, not some physical building. No, you, God designed you to be the dwelling place of God. Now you're not God, you're not but his spirit can dwell in you because you were designed that way. You were designed to be his temple, to be devoted so that, so that all of the world could look and see and say, well, there, they are devoted to God. And so, 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 so all the world could say, hey, there is, man, we see God in their lives. You're, you're devoted to dwelling place. But there's two other words in scripture I wanna to talk to you about to kind of deepen our, our thought process on this. The first word is the word Numa, numa, which is a Greek word for spirit, right? John chapter three, verse five, Jesus is meeting with Nicodemus and, 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 and Jesus says these words to Nicodemus. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Unless they are born of water and the spirit. Water, the, the right water, the, the, the idea of baptism, the idea of the outward sign of an inward work that God has done in our life, right? The, the very concept of water in this passage of scripture often deals with the process of being birthed into this world physically. You have to be born of water and of the spirit. And the word there is pneuma. So Jesus is saying, hey man, if you're, if, if the, only way to, the only way to enter the kingdom of God is to be born of the spirit. The pneuma. Well, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 15, and other places in the scripture, in this particular place, Paul calls you by a term. There's the pneuma, there's the spirit, and then Paul says that each one of us is the pneumatikos. Are you following the connection? Pneuma is the spirit. 
You are the pneumatikos. And what that means is you were created and designed by God as a spiritual being. You have a capacity and you have a capability for the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. In fact, without the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, the scripture would say you're not functioning as God intended you to function. Right? You're, not, you're not fulfilling your purpose. You're not, you're not thinking how you should. You're not, I mean, there's, right? But the Holy Spirit is to dwell in you to fully be, right? You are the pneumatikos created with this capability and this capacity for the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. Now, you know what the results of being the temple of God and being the pneumatikos is? It says it right there in the verse that we've read. We come to the recognition that we are not our own. Like, I, I don't live here just for my own purposes. I don't live here for my own desires or my own dreams or, or my own. That's not why I've been created. I wasn't created by God so that, so that, so that I could kind of go, hey, man, this is everything I want to do in life. No, I recognize that I'm not my own. It says that, that we belong to someone else. We've been bought at a price. So therefore, it says we live differently. We live to honor God in this world. Now, I've already said, you know, every, every analogy we try, try to use, it, it, it falls a little bit short, right? It just falls short. Every physical analogy we try to use. Well, I'm going to try to use a Hollywood analogy. So if you want to talk about falling short, right, this may fall way, way short. But but how many of you have ever seen the movie I, Robot? Did you ever seen the movie I, Robot? Uh, came out in 2004, right? I'm not recommending that you go home and watch the movie. You probably could stream it if you wanted to. But anyhow, I'm not, I'm not recommending the movie. But, but I mean, there's, there's a storyline here that, that kind of almost parallels a little bit about us. So in the movie I, Robot, there are thousands of robots being created, tens of thousands. Millions of robots being created. Because I, I think the idea in the movie is that everybody will have their own personalized robot at some point, right? Everybody's going to have a robot. Well, there was one particular robot created named Sonny. But his creator, Alfred Lanning in the movie, created him differently than all the other robots. Like Sonny could feel emotions. Sonny could dream dreams. Sonny was built more durable with the material and the alloys in which they made Sonny of. Sonny was faster. Sonny was stronger than all the other robots. And, and ultimately what begins to happen in the story is that Sonny begins to question, why is he so different? Why am I so different than all the other robots created? Why am I different than everyone else? And then in the movie, as you, as you watch it, he finally identifies his purpose, right? He identifies that his purpose, he was created this way by his creator to fight against the takeover of humanity by an evil force. Now, all analogies fall short, right? So, right, you, you probably already said, okay, here's, um, I'm writing my notes here. Here's 10 reasons why I, robot, falls short. You write it down on a piece of paper. You make your way to see me out in the lobby. Before you get to me, please drop that in the trash can. But anyhow, <laughs> I get it. It falls short, right? It's, it's not going to be the answer to everything. But here's what I want you to understand. God has created you differently than all the other animals on this planet. He created you as the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's created you as the pneumatikos built for the Spirit to dwell in you. You have been designed by your Creator to receive and operate by the Holy Spirit in your life. You've been created to live in harmony with God as your father and Jesus as your brother and the Holy Spirit as your guide. You've been designed to follow his will even in this fallen place. You've been designed to live for his glory, to push back the enemy, to bring others into deep relationship and knowledge with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so in life. Now, now you know, the enemy does not want you to know this. 
The enemy doesn't want you to acknowledge it. The enemy doesn't want you to believe it. The enemy doesn't want you to receive this. The enemy wants you to, 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 to reject all of that. But even if he can't get you to reject God, the Holy Spirit, and who he is, man, you know what else what he wants to do? Is he wants to just distract you. And he doesn't have to distract you by a ton. He just has to distract you a little bit. So, right, I mean, like, like if you're saying, I'm going to live in alignment with God. I'm, I'm going to live in a, alignment with the work of the Spirit in my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to follow God's will for my life. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things. Man, it's not like the devil has to get you to go this way. All he has to do is get you off by this much. And if he just distracts you a little bit, what happens is over time, you end up farther and farther and farther away from where it is that God has designed you to be and how it is that God has designed you to think. Man, what it is that God's designed you to do. I mean, it doesn't take much. You've heard the saying, you know, oftentimes good things are the enemy to the best things. Because we can have good things and there's a lot of good things. And I mean, we can focus our lives on having a lot of good things in life. But the best is, but boy, it's not hard for those good things to distract us for the best of what God designed you for. Ephesians 2.10, the Apostle Paul says this, have no doubt you are God's handiwork. You have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now listen to this part which God prepared in advance for you to do. So, I mean, get your mind around that. I mean, God's designed in advance for you to accomplish these good things in your life. He's designed you for that. He's designed you for it with the capacity and the capability of the Holy Spirit to live in your heart and fulfill the plan he has for you. I mean, that's a phrase we like, don't we? Man, God has a plan for my life. Gives us purpose, gives us meaning. You know, we have to go, man, I'm trying to find God's plan for my life. Do you know you cannot find God's plan for your life absent of the Holy Spirit working within you? It's the only way you're going to understand it. It's the only way your mind and your heart's going to be expanded enough to understand the potential that God believes you hold to make a difference in this world. And, 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 right, and, and the Holy Spirit, he has helped you, he has guided you, he has cleansed you, and he has empowered empowered you to do those very things from the inside out. Like, like John chapter 16, verse seven. I love this verse, right? There's a powerful teaching in this. The words of Jesus speaking to his disciples. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Now, I, I, can, I can probably pretty much make a, make a solid guess that not any disciple agreed with that statement. That when Jesus looked at him and said, look, I'm going to go away, but it's for your good that I'm leaving. Right? They're probably like, no, 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 we don't want you to go away. We need you here. We're not going to know what to do. We're going to be lost without you. I, right? I'm sure their minds filled up with all sorts of thoughts. But Jesus says, man, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, he says, the advocate, the spirit will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Now, you know what Jesus is doing? You know what God's doing? What he's doing is he's he's shifting your dominant impulse in life. Right? I mean, in Jesus' day, to be considered a disciple of Jesus meant that you went where Jesus went. There was an external impulse. Here Jesus is, right? And Jesus is... Going to Galilee, so you go to Galilee. Then Jesus is going to Jerusalem, so you go to Jerusalem. Jesus is going to Jericho, so you're going to Jericho. There is an external impulse that you're reacting to. But what Jesus is doing, what Jesus is saying, what he's teaching, what he's instructing, is he's wanting the dominant impulse to shift from external to internal in your life. The Holy Spirit in you. You see, God desires that you are way more than just an instinctual animal that responds only to external impulses. 
I mean, that's, 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 man, he wants you to, he wants you to be led from the inside out, from the work of his spirit in you to what you do out here, right? He doesn't want you simply to, to respond to the external things you see, right? I mean, that's why, that's why people can choose to be more than just survive themselves. That's why you can make sacrificial choices in life, right? Because man, it's not just the external thing you see that you desire or you want but there's an internal sacrificial mechanism that lines up with God that's such a beautiful thing in this world, right? You, you, you cannot be mastered by external elements. You do not have to be mastered by them or, or by material gain or by prosperity. The scripture says you can serve another master. It's not the external master of all the material gain you can have. There's an internal master that you can serve, that can dominate you and direct you in life. Man, your bodily, your physical drives do not have to dominate you in this world. The impulses of the Holy Spirit can direct you in life. Your peace doesn't have to be found in creature comforts. They can be found in relationship with your heavenly Father. Like there, there's a verse, and we use this verse often, right? A lot of times we use this verse when, uh, when, a, when a Christian parent is concerned about their kids and what direction they're going in life. And you've heard this, right? You've heard, it, you've heard it dozens and dozens of times. God's word does not return void. So, right, somebody's, right, there's a parent and they're concerned about their kids and, you know, they may be in high school or they may be adults and they're telling some of their Christian friends, like, hey, you sowed God's word in their life and God's word does not return void. Or you're at work and you're like, yeah, I'm having this trouble. I'm having this concern. Da, da, da. Hey man, you need to speak God's word over that situation. You need to like tell that person what God's word says. Why? Because God's word doesn't return void. Do you ever wonder why that is? Do you ever wonder why God's word does not return void? I mean, right, obviously because God's word is incredibly powerful, right? In and of itself. I mean, God's word is incredibly powerful. But the scripture answers this question more than a hundred times because you have been created with the capacity for God's word to be internalized in you. Man, God's word isn't like my word. God's word is more powerful than your father's word or your mother's word. I mean, you have been designed for God's word to be What's it say in the scripture? Written on your heart. There's this internal power in the way in which God has designed you to respond to him and respond to his words. Therefore, his words, as, as incredibly powerful as they are in and of themselves, right? He creates through his words, right? When he spoke creation into existence, man, you have been created to respond to his words. Now, now, you know, in all of this truth and all of this reality of, of like, like this, is the, this is God, the Holy Spirit, right? His role in our lives and, and what he does for us and in us. And there have been layers of concerns ultimately that, that people just, right, for whatever reason, hold off the spirit or reject the spirit or like, oh, I don't, you know, it's a little bit. And in fact, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus about this concern. This is what he says. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve. Don't resist. Don't hinder. Don't push back the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Don't fight against what God wants to do in you. Work to become more sensitive to the work of the Spirit. So let's talk just for a second. Like, how do we become, how do we become more sensitive to the work in the Spirit in us? So, so, just, so just a couple of very simple thoughts in how we do that. One is, is we recognize how God has made us. You accept how God has made you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what you were designed to be, right? You are the pneumatikos designed for the pneuma to dwell in you. You just recognize that. 
Hey, this is who I am. And, and if I don't accept this and, and if I don't receive and, and acknowledge and, and embrace, then, then I'm not functioning the way God has designed for me to function because I'm, I'm not supposed to function alone in this world. I'm supposed to function in connection and cooperation with him. And then we embrace all the functions of the Spirit's role in our life. Right, and I mean, boy, you should read and through the scriptures, right, as you do the name study, as you see what the Holy Spirit, what his roles are in the scripture. Man, man, it's going to enhance your, your understanding of, of, of the Spirit at work in you. And then you need to start practicing the presence of the Spirit. You know, when, 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 when doubt shows up, when you doubt God about something, right, and you're like, okay, you know, the Holy Spirit's role is to, is to, is to lead me into all truth. So, you know, I'm having a question about this. So, you know, so you pray about it and you, and you come before the Lord and, and you ask for the spirit to teach you and, 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 and you read your scriptures, right? And we say the scripture is living and active. You know why it's living and active? Because of the work of the spirit in it and through it. You know, you, 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 you give yourself to, to, to the Holy Spirit in, in intense times when you're about ready to have that argument with your spouse and you're about ready to say something. You're about ready to, to have these issues at work or you're about ready to respond in a way that, that really isn't a, isn't a way that honors God. And you're like, whoa, I need to stop. What should I do here? You recognize the work of the Spirit in you and you pause and extend the time for the Spirit to do work in you. And then, and then ultimately, you build intentional relationships with other people that follow the Spirit. Because you learn from them, and you grow from them, and you see it in their lives, and you respond to that. You know, in the Scripture, it talks about that we're all born with, with a foreskin over our hearts, a lack of sensitivity to God in our hearts. Right? We're broken, right? We're, we're born sinners, separated. But, but it also talks about people that have grown a callousness on their hearts. And, and you know what happens with the foreskin or with the callousness. There's a lack of sensitivity. But the good news is, is that God promises us that if we turn to him, right? If we ask him to remove that callousness, however it formed, however it formed in our hearts and our lives, if it formed because of something somebody did to us or it formed because of, because, I, because of a certain direction our life went that we didn't desire or it formed because of disappointments we have or if it formed because of, you name the reason, whatever that callousness formed from, God has a healing and the ability to remove that and help us become sensitive to the work of the Spirit in us. Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Jesus, I praise you for the way that you have designed us, that you designed us not to live in this world alone, not to be on our own when it comes to decisions, when it comes to purpose, when it comes to what our dreams are, when it comes to what we desire, when it comes to how we relate, but you've designed us to be filled with your spirit as our guide and our helper and our cleanser and our empowerer. And Jesus, I praise you for that. I praise you that, that Lord, you send your spirit to fill our hearts and to fill our minds. So Jesus, I pray right now for every single one of us that we would be people, not simply of the physical, but that we would be people of the spirit, directed, by your hand, not simply by what we see, but by the words you speak to us. We love you, Jesus. We need you. And this morning, Lord, we ask you, man, cleanse our mind, cleanse our thoughts, cleanse our emotions, cleanse us so that we can hear and respond to you. Make us sensitive, oh Jesus. Lord, in response to your goodness and grace, receive what it is we bring. We know you don't need any of the finances that we bring. 
but nevertheless, you ask us to partner with you. You ask us to be dependent upon you and to do our part, to be obedient to your calling. So Lord, even today, let us respond to the spirit that you have implanted within us. Receive what it is we bring. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen.
God, we thank you for all that you have done in this place today, for all that you've done in our hearts and minds, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. For all of our family and friends who are watching us online, we're going to continue our worship through giving. Giving is an important part of being a Christian and part of our Christian tradition, so there are many ways to give. You can give in the app, you can give on text, you can give online through our website, and you can even mail it in. For those who might be with us for the first time, there is no obligation at all to give. We are just delighted that you are with us. In 2023, we're going back to the Holy Land. So if you're interested in finding out more information for those who are on site, you can go see Pastor Dave or at the table outside. And we want to wish all the fathers and father figures in our lives a happy Father's Day and then a happy Juneteenth. Please stack the chair seven high and guess what? God be with you as you go.